Okay, let's go back in our Bibles to Judges chapter 6. Just to review, we said uh, that our challenge is to have a plan, Luke 14, but also that it should be one that integrates faith into our lives and our businesses. How do we do that? And we're looking now at uh, Gideon in Judges chapter 6, seven elements. The first element is to have a purpose or mission statement, and we covered that in the last uh, session. In this session, we want to look again at the second, or look at the next element. And let's begin by uh, going to verse 15. Uh, you recall in verse 14, the Lord turned to him and he said, Go in this your strength and save Israel out of Midian's hand. And I'm not, am I not sending you? Verse 15. But Lord Gideon asked, How? Now that's a great question. Remember we said Gideon was a farmer. He doesn't have any background in military or education and military practices, and, and yet he's being asked to do something he's not equipped for. Legitimate question. Now look what the Lord says. He says uh, in verse 16, The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. The second element of a faith plan is to form a partnership with God. Notice God didn't say to Gideon, go out and defeat the Midianites and I wish you a lot of luck. <laughs> he says, we're going to do this together. Now in your business and in your personal life, the challenge is to form a partnership with God whereby you are involved and He is involved in such a way that you're accomplishing the mission to which He's called you. Several years ago, I entered into a partnership uh, with a financial partner, and we purchased a company. And I really began to understand the elements of a partnership. It doesn't mean that the partners are equal. It means simply that each is providing their distinctive. So my financial partner provided the money, and then I provided the leadership in running the company. And we were each doing our part. We accomplished our mission together. And that's really what the Lord's suggesting to Gideon, is that, Gideon, if you'll work with me, we'll accomplish the mission together. Now, what that means in a partnership is there's two parts. There's God's part, and there's my part. Let's look at Scripture to see what God promises to each of us as we get in a partnership relationship with Him in terms of what He will provide. First of all, He promises to direct us. So if we're concerned about what we should do in our businesses or organization, Scripture says that God, in His partnership role with us, will direct us. Psalm 25, verse 12. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should go. Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Isn't that exciting? You can go into your business, into your organization, and if you're not sure exactly what to do as you form a partnership with God, He promises that He will direct you. He will direct your path, just as He's going to do with Gideon. Then the second thing from Scripture, He promises that He will provide. He'll provide what we need. Look at verse, uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. My God shall meet all your needs according to His riches and glory. Psalm 34, 10. The lions may go weak and hungry, but they that seek the Lord should lack no good thing. So that means when we come to the mission of accomplishing what God's called us to do, and we need resources, who is supposed to provide those? The Lord. So it says He'll direct us, He'll tell us what to do, He'll provide our resources. And then in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says He rewards us, those that earnestly seek Him. So He's a rewarder. So you go into your partnership and you say, God, you're going to direct me. That's great. It takes the pressure off. You're going to provide all my resources. That's wonderful. And then you're going to reward the efforts. That's a wonderful partnership. That's God's part. Now, what's our part? Well, in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, we're reminded that the righteous will live by faith. That means faith. Colossians 2 Verse 6, just as you have received Christ Jesus, so walk with Him. How did we receive Christ? By faith. 
How are we supposed to walk with him? By faith. In Hebrews 11.6, we mentioned earlier, without faith it is impossible to please God. So picture this. We have a partnership. God's part to direct, to provide, and reward. And our part is to trust, is to have faith. Let me show you how this works. Last September, I received a very unusual call from our newly elected governor in the state of Georgia. Uh, He's the first Republican governor in 130 years, strong believer, and uh, he asked me to come down and meet with him. So I went down and met with him. And There's a department in Georgia that has historically been one of the most difficult uh, to run. It's the Department of Human Resources. Uh, 20,000 employees, $3 billion budget, and it basically provides most, if not all, of the human service uh, uh, services in the state of Georgia. The Division of Children and Family Services, Mental Health, Public Health. And uh, he was interested in my background, and he wanted to know if I would be interested in considering stepping in and running the department. Uh, I was obviously flattered, but then I said, well, I've got an existing business. I can't do that, but let me tell you what I will do. Uh, I will take the time that I normally would spend in ministry because I wasn't really doing anything outside my business at that time. And I said, I'll make myself available to you 30% of my time. Now, I didn't tell him, but I said, also what I'll do is after I pray about this and really think through it, is I'll enter into a partnership with my partner, God. And I'll, I'll bring him to the table. Now, It's interesting, our governor, it turns out, had attended one of my workshops in leadership uh, dynamics many years ago, and uh, I found out later he was a little familiar with this process. Uh, So basically what happened is that uh, September 17th of last year, uh, I became chairman of the Department of Human Resources, uh, and the governor terminated the commissioner, that's our CEO, and we started to search for a new CEO, but in the meantime, as chairman, Uh, My job was to try to bring some organization and help turn this huge department around uh, with 30% of my time. But I had a great partner. My partner directed me, provided my needs, and rewarded. Uh, It was very interesting when we first started, we were sworn in at the Capitol, that is I and eight other board members, put in a car taken to our first board meeting, which was public, I walked into the room and there were four television cameras representing each of the networks and a hundred people crowded into the uh, meeting room because it was a public forum and the first order of business was to elect me chairman. The second order of business was to cut a hundred million dollars off of our budget for the year because of reduced revenue. Now how's that for an interesting way to start? (laughs) Uh, We had been prepped ahead of time to say well just leave the budget alone but what happened was that Uh, there was so much resistance to the proposed budget, there was shutting down a lot of services throughout the state, uh, that we felt as a new board we really couldn't do that. Uh, So I had a chance to practice what I preach here. And uh, if you're in a partnership with God, He provides the direction, and He provides the resources. Uh, We were able to get with some of the board members and some of the existing staff, and one month later we came back and proposed a new budget Uh, that cut a hundred million dollars off our budget without cutting any substantial services. And this was a phenomenal achievement. Uh, Later on, the governor's office asked us to come and share this methodology uh, with other departments uh, in the state of Georgia. Uh, And what we did is we just basically showed them uh, how to go about trimming a large bureaucracy so that you can maintain services. Uh, But really what happened was God gave us direction. God gave us wisdom because I have my partner with me. So in our challenge in running our business and in our personal lives, it's to form this partnership with God. Remember what Gideon said? He said, Lord, how am I going to do it? And the answer is, with me. Remember the Lord said in John, He said, without me you can do nothing. And yet so often in our personal lives and our businesses, we miss out on linking specifically with the Lord every day to trust Him to provide direction, resources, and a reward. Now, remember I said our part was to provide faith. And what I'd like to do is elaborate a little bit on what I mean by biblical faith. And I'd like to share with you three characteristics of biblical faith. First of all, it tends to be the opposite 
of what you can see. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, biblical faith is def defined as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. When I was asked to take on this role with the governor, I couldn't see how in the world, with 30% of my time, I could make any difference. I had never done this before. But in our lives, when we encounter situations and you literally scratch your head and say, I don't see how I can do this, then that's an opportunity to trust the Lord. Many times when we encounter those situations, our emotional reaction is to become anxious and fearful. But if we recognize that those are the opportunities we have to trust the Lord, then it gives us a chance to become excited. Because so often in our lives, we have been able to put all of our needs together somehow. So there's very few areas sometimes that we trust the Lord for. And when He's given us things, then we thank Him for what He's given us. But when He gives us those unique areas to trust Him, then we should get excited. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul says, We live by faith, not by sight. It's almost like the two are in opposition to each other. If you're living a life of sight, that means you can see everything's going to work out, then you really have no chance to trust the Lord. But if He gives you those opportunities to step out and to basically say, Lord, I don't know how we're going to do this, then that becomes an opportunity to exercise faith. An example of this is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. The person is Noah, and Noah becomes one of those individuals in the faith hall of uh, fame. And it says this about Noah in verse 7, When warned about things not yet seen, now what he had not seen? Well, you recall the story, the Lord told Noah that he was going to bring a flood on the earth. And, the Lord, and Noah said, Lord, what's a flood? And the Lord said, what's well, a lot of rain? And Noah said, well, what's a lot of rain? Because prior to Noah's time, the earth was watered more by a greenhouse effect. There had not been droplets of rain. So he was asked to do something to, uh, and to deal with an issue he had never seen. And yet it says he prepared an ark to save his family. So you get the idea? He couldn't see how this thing was going to happen, but what did he end up doing? He prepared an ark. So he was responding by faith to do what God had called him to do. The second characteristic of biblical faith is the object is God and His Word. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. When I come home each evening, I walk into my house, and I feel these two eyeballs focused on me. And wherever I go in the kitchen, these eyeballs never leave me. It's our German Shepherd. He's 12 years old, and if you ever want a picture of fixing your eyes, you've got to see my German Shepherd. When I come home, he won't let me out of his sight. Now, why do you think that is? I provide for him. I provide him a walk, and he's thrilled with that, and I provide his food, and he knows it's coming from me. So when I walk in, his ears go up, and he's tuned in to wherever I am with the thought that maybe I'm going to take him on a walk now or feed him. And he fixes his eyes right wherever I go. He just follows me right around. Now, what if we did that with the Lord? What if we fixed our eyes spiritually on the Lord and tuned our sensitivity to the fact that he provides for us? He takes us on the walk. He provides for our food. And, and that's, that, that's what the meaning of that verse is, just to fix and rivet our eyes upon the Lord as the object of our faith. And then the third characteristic is biblical faith always involves action. In James chapter 2, verse 17, James says this, Faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. In other words, until we actually step out and do something and take a step, we've not really exercised faith. It's been more of an intellectual ascent. Example of this would be Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. The Lord came to him and said, Abraham, I'm going to give you an inheritance, but I want you to leave Ur. So Abraham packs up all of his possessions, his family, starts to move out, and then he goes back to the Lord and says, Lord, where do you want me to go? And the Lord's silent. And the scripture says, he went out not even knowing where he was going. 
And has that ever happened to you? God given you a sense of call and mission, and you load up everything, and you're, you're all set to move out, you're stepping out by faith, and then there's silence. Why does he do that? Because he's going to give us the answer one step at a time. See, a lot of times what we want to do is look at the whole plan. We want to see where we're going, how we're going to get there, and then we say, Lord, will agree. But he wants us to trust him and exercise that faith step. Uh, when I signed on to be chairman of this Department of Human Resources, uh, the real risky faith part was realizing that we had just terminated the commissioner and then I was it. <laughs> and you look around and you say, okay, what happens next? And that's where we've got to trust the Lord. We've got to ask Him to give us that sense of His presence. We fix our eyes upon Him and then we demonstrate action. Let me illustrate the process uh, in something that happened to me a number of years ago. Uh, I used to enjoy skiing. Uh, in the more recent years, I don't do it as much. But uh, when I was young, I lived out in California. And we used to go skiing on the weekends up in Mammoth Mountain, which is a mountain in the southern Sierras, uh, about 10,000 feet high. And I was having one of those days where everything was going well. Now, I'm not a good skier, but occasionally I do things well. And I was looking around for a photographer. I couldn't find one. I wanted to record this uh, event forever. Uh, but it was about 3.30 in the afternoon, and uh, Buddy and I were at the bottom of the mountain, and we decided to make one more run all the way from the top down. Uh, so we hopped in the gondola. There were about six high school girls there that got in with us, and we started to the top of the mountain. Uh, halfway to the top of the mountain in this gondola, the gondola stopped. And we made small talk, anticipating that at any moment it would be starting up again. Uh, Thirty minutes went by. The sun went down behind the mountain, and at that altitude it starts to get pretty cold. Another 30 minutes went by, and the wind picks up, and we start swaying in the wind. Uh, one of the girls starts crying. Another girl uh, almost passed out on us. Now, I was a bachelor at the time, and I didn't know how to deal with crying women. I've been married 32 years, and I still don't know how to deal with crying women. <laughs> but all of a sudden, I heard this sound. Somebody was knocking on the top of the gondola. And I was nearest the window, so it had a crank, and I rolled it down, and his head appeared upside down. And it was a ski patrol. He'd inched his way down the cable, and he said, do you want to get out? I said, well, show us, show us the way. So he reached his hand into the gondola, and in his hand was a wide strap, about like a wide belt. And he said, look, put this over your head, under your arms. I'm going to attach it to an automatic clutch on top of the gondola, and all you have to do is step out, and then it holds you up as you go straight down. I said, well, who's first? <laughs> he said, well, you are. I was nearest the door. Now, I didn't see any other way of getting down. So I put that over my head, under my arms, now, see, I was an engineering major in college, and I could write the equations that govern that clutch, but he didn't ask me for that. See, that's intellectual assent. He wanted me to put my trust and faith in this device. So I put it over my head, under my arms. We opened the door. I stepped out into space, and I went straight down, slowly. It held me up. Now, why did it hold me up? It wasn't the amount of faith I had. Because my faith, my knees were knocked and I was scared to death. But it was the object of my faith. See, the object of my faith was worthy of my faith. That was a well-designed clutch, and it held me up. And I think in the Christian life, sometimes we drift into having faith in faith. It's the idea that if we can only muster enough faith, we can get God to do something. But that's not it. Jesus said it's a faith of a grain of mustard seed. So this held me up all the way down because the object was worthy of my faith. Who's the object of our faith? The Lord. So in biblical faith, it tends to be the opposite of what you can see. The object is the Lord, and we must exercise action as God gives us opportunities to trust Him. As you go into your workshop, we're going to have give you an opportunity to talk about and how to apply forming a partnership with God in your company and looking for those opportunities to trust Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this challenge from Your Word to form a partnership with You. The fact that You will direct us, 
and you will provide and you will reward our efforts. And the challenge we have of just exercising faith one day at a time, putting our trust in you, show us how to do that and give us the courage to step out in Jesus' name. Amen.